All right, so we are in class 10. And let me go to class 10. Or actually the previous class. Well, yeah, so we're in class 10. Um, today, we didn't quite finish part eight, which I actually forgot about. Um, I was so focused on creating part nine materials that I forgot we didn't finish part eight. But I don't think we actually will do that today. If we have time next week, I'll go over it. But the last part we didn't cover had to do with uh, essentially using map when it doesn't work on all of your elements of your list. Um, so I'll briefly go over that next week if we have time, but I think that's not um, super important. I wanna get into stats stuff. So that's what mostly we'll be working on today. Um, but as far as last class, the muddiest points, um, a lot of confusion about nesting data, which I totally expected. I think that, um, that idea and concept of a nested data set is extremely strange, <laughs> especially not having seen something like that with list columns before. So I think that's just gonna take practice. Um, I'd be happy to go over any of the bits anytime again. Um, we're not really gonna use it much to, I don't think we'll have time to talk about it today, but next week I might try to do a couple more examples. Um, and just using map in general is, is gonna take some practice. Um, and then also learning to use functions. I think that also can be can get very complicated very quickly. So if there's any particular function you want me to go over again, I'd be happy to. Um, in the meantime, I think today we're not doing much with functions, but next week I'll try to go over functions again a little bit more. Um, and then there was a comment that the stats part was nice and clear last time, which is good because I think some of you, most of you probably have some experience with, with statistical modeling um, or running tests and so on in, in some kind of software at least. Um, and today we're going to do a lot more of that. Um, and I think there was a couple of comments about uh, kind of useful tidbits. And I, I think that's what I tried to do for this class. So hopefully, um, we're gonna cover a lot of statistical methods today and I can't really assume that you all know how to run all of those models and understand all the assumptions of them. And, and I can't really get into that so much deeply, um, but I do wanna just show kind of a overview. Um, this is kind of how you fit a model. This is a useful package to, to create a table, that kind of thing. So the useful tidbits that I've kind of run across throughout my now many years of doing this. Um, that's what I wanna share with you today. And so things like um, p-value formatting and, and error bar plots and stuff, I think that's really can make your analysis work a lot more um, fast and, and enjoyable. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, just realized I didn't, I came from my chat. So let me pull that up. Um, so yeah, we'll start with, with part part nine, um, which is up on Dropbox. And that. So hide everything. Um, so part nine is all stats stuff, which it's kind of funny that we took so long to get to stats, but I, I thought of this class more as um, an R programming class and wanted to be kind of light on the statistical modeling part just because that can go deep really quickly. Um, but it is very useful to see. So I think it's a good thing. Let me save this as my own. Okay. So today I call this more stats, broom and tables. So kind of following along what we learned last week about statistical models in R. Look at all these, all sorts of packages today. Actually, I didn't need this one, but uh, all this other stuff, I just kind of threw a bunch of packages at you um, and these all do various things. Uh, hopefully you're able to run this. I, I think they're all on CRAN, so I, I think this should work for you, but if you're having trouble, let me know. Um, and then today, so we're going to talk about additional statistical tests, like we talked about t-test last time. We'll also talk about things like chi-squared test, ANOVA, very, very briefly. Um, other kind of regression models, logistic regression, Cox proportional hazards regression, 
a couple more visualizations um, related to missing data um, and correlation. And then we'll also focus on making tables related to our data, which I think is, is an important thing to know how to do if you're analyzing any, any kind of data. Um, and so, yeah, I put this warning here that I expect if you've, for example, never heard of an ANOVA and I start talking about sums of squares and type one versus type three sums of squares and all that stuff, it's gonna sound like nonsense. So I, if, you're, if you're not super familiar with some of these models, that's okay. You can zone out and then come back if there's something that interests you. Um, I'm hoping that if you do need this information, you it will be nice for you to have kind of this resource to look it up if you ever do need, need, do need to come back and, and say fit a survival model or something. Um, so it's gonna be very particular to what data you're used to working with or what stats classes you've had. But also feel free to ask questions if you want more clarification. I wasn't really exactly sure how deep to go into each of these. So some things might be very cursory. Um, and again, this isn't meant to be a statistics class. I, hopefully I don't say anything incorrect. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's always a, a risk. Um, but I just kind of want to show you how you fit these models in R and what you do with that output. But there are, again, many books about this here, are a couple that I find useful. Um, there's a lot of books now that are like survival data in R or categorical models in R or things like that, where they actually go through the stats and tell you how to run the code, um, which, is, which is pretty useful. So today we have a few data sets just kind of by the nature of, we need different kinds of data for different analyses. Um, one data that uh, was in last year's class that I thought was interesting is this data set called the Pima Indians data, Diabetes data set. It's found in a package called ML Bench. And so this is data, um, it actually was in a couple different places online. Um, I think people have used this data as kind of a machine learning modeling example data for a while. Um, and this, you can read about it. Um, there's this blog post that used it and they talk about it. But basically it's about 700, and, so there's 768 women from the Native American tribe, the Pima tribe, which uh, is based, was, they live in an area that now is Arizona. Um, and so they took measurements on a bunch of women, on all of these women related to their diabetes status. That was the main outcome that they're interested in. So we have diabetes status, yes or no. And then we also have a bunch of predictive risk factors such as the number of pregnancies, uh, plasma glucose concentration, diastolic blood pressure, tricep skin fold, thickness, insulin measurements, BMI, um, and then this diabetes pedigree function, which is a function that's related to kind of um, family risk, I think, um, and their age. So I'll show some models using this data mainly because there, there is a lot of association in this data. And so it's nice to see that, um, but I'm not really treating this very rigorously. There's a lot of variables here and most of them are pretty correlated. Um, so this is all just really like examples, just so you know, but it was an interesting data set. Um, when you use a data in a package, I think I've, you've seen this before with the penguins data, usually you load it with this function data. And there's actually two different data sets in that package, Pima Indians Diabetes and then Pima Indians Diabetes 2. And the reason for that is, interestingly, when they um, first loaded in the data, I guess, they didn't realize that there was kind of an unusual issue that missing data was coded as zero in numeric values. And so they corrected it with this uh, second version. Um, and so that's something that, maybe like it's kind of one of those odd things that can happen that you might not notice right away because it's just being read in at zero. But if you were to try to plot something like here's a histogram of the tricep thickness in that original data set, that's where something kind of a weird artifact will show up. Um, so you can see obviously that it doesn't really make sense to have a thickness of zero, but there are a ton of, of observations that have that value. Whereas the rest are more reasonably between like five and, 60 or 100, I guess. Um, so that showed up in a bunch of different variables and you could fix that yourself. Um, this is what the, the fixed version looks like, just so you can see there's no more zeros. Um, that makes more sense. 
And so we could have done this ourselves with the NA if function, which changes a value to NA. So NA if takes a column and uh, the, very, the, the numbers or the values that <clears throat> we would set to missing. Um, we've seen this in a previous example, I think. And so we could say, let's mutate across all numeric columns, um, except the one called pregnant, because there are a lot of people that had zero pregnancies. So the zero actually makes sense in that column, and we don't want to replace that with NA. But any other numeric columns, um, <clears throat> Let me just show it to you so you can see. Um, so there's the pregnant column. We don't want to mess with that. But all of these other ones, which were numeric, have a lot of zeros, so insulin, triceps, et cetera. That's what we would want to switch to NA. So if we run this, now we can see insulin has NAs, triceps has NAs, pregnancy zeros are still there. Um, and so I wanted to show you this example because this is kind of a, an interesting way to input columns. You can have, you can put uh, like these tidy select functions together. So this is saying concatenate the columns where they are numeric. So all the numeric columns except pregnant. So remove with the negative sign pregnant. And that works um, as you can see, cause this still has a zero. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you that example, but I, do, I did, did just take that the revised data. I also called it something else because I kept getting confused between the two. So the data we're going to work with is Pima underscore diabetes just for future code. Um, so let's just skim it just to kind of get us. Oh, I didn't run that. Let's skim it so we can see what the values are. Um, we have diabetes is a factor. Um, complete rate is one, which means there's no missing two unique values. Um, and then the rest are numeric, age, et cetera. And uh, the biggest missing data is in insulin. Only about 50% have data on insulin values. Um, and you get a little histogram. So we can see there's mostly numeric data, not really any categorical data here. Pregnancy though, number of pregnancies is a, technically an integer because it's zero, one, two, three, et cetera. Um, which the mean is 3.85. Um, okay, so in terms of summarizing data, I think the first thing I wanted to talk about, which I briefly talked about last class, is how do you make a table one, essentially? So when you're doing a study, like a, maybe an epidemiology study or cohort study, or even a, even maybe even a basic science study, it's probably less common because you're, you're usually in basic science, you're defining your um, groups and your factors. So more often in a cohort study, the first thing you do is to summarize all of the values in your data set. Um, and so GT summary is a package that I use a lot for this, but there are many packages that do the same kind of thing. It's kind of up to you what, what format you like, um, but I'm gonna show just a couple. So here's GT summary. Table summary is the function in that package. And we can see that it makes a nice HTML um, table. By default, it tells us the name of the value or the measurement. It gives us missing data in a row that's uh, labeled unknown. It gives us the sample size and it gives us median interquartile range of our, all our variables. And then for the categorical like diabetes, it gives us N and percent. Um, I'd say it's actually pretty, most common to show mean and standard deviation by default. And then if you have skewed data or um, just not very not normally distributed data, you usually do median and interquartile range, but it's kind of nice that they give you that by default. This you can change and I will show you some examples of that. Um, usually though, before we do that, usually if you're having a cohort study, you have some sort of variable of interest that you wanna stratify that information by. And so in this case, we'll show this information, but stratified by diabetes. And so the way you do that is just add this by equals diabetes um, argument in the table summary. And so that automatically breaks it up into two. It's pretty slow, I guess, because it's, I don't know why it's, it shouldn't be that slow, but apparently it's a lot of work. Um, 
So we see now negative and positive are our two values for diabetes and we have the sample size within each group. And then you have the summary measures of every, uh, every predictor or characteristic. Um, I would say it's pretty common to see a table one in a paper like this, where you have um, a stratification variable and then you show the summary statistics for all of your variables. Um, a lot of people do add p-values, so it's not really recommended to do that, mainly because of this idea of overusing p-values and you're not really, like, why are you testing this? It's not, it's not that useful of information. You should have some primary analysis that incorporates these predictors with your, with your outcome. So generally I try to not encourage my collaborators to show p-value though sometimes I am outvoted. Um, so we have to do it anyway. But in this case, it doesn't really, I mean, everything's so significant that we're not really getting that much information out of this anyway. But there is a function, add p, that adds a p-value for you. It even tells you what test that it's from, the Wilcoxon rank some test. Um, because all of these are continuous and it used the non-parametric non -parametric test by default. So um, that is nice. These functions have a ton of um, like customization, I guess. You can change all kinds of things. So if you want to change, for example, you don't like that the interquartile range and the median are showing up, let's say for something like triceps, we saw that plot, it looked quite normally distributed. It was very symmetric and, and nice. So maybe we just wanna show the mean and the standard, de standard deviation of that. Um, you can specify each one individually, or you can say, I want all continuous to be mean standard deviation. And so this goes in the statistic argument of table summary as a list, because you can specify each column name separately if you want. In this case, I'm just saying all of my continuous values. Um, this syntax is actually from a package called Glue, which I will introduce to you in a little bit. Um, very useful string pasting together type gluing together package, which I'll show you. But for now, this just basically means put the mean here and put the standard deviation in parentheses. So let's look at that. And you can see all of them have been converted to that. So depending on what you wanna show, you can tell it that's what you want. Um, here's an example of just switching three of them. So the rest are gonna be median, IQR, and a quartile range. And then these three values are going to have mean and standard deviation. So that's the, um, again, kind of the tidy select options here where I can say, um, the other thing I changed with this one is that I made pregnant, the variable pregnant, a factor, which is going to by default tell table summary that actually I want the, the counts and the percents for each level of that factor. The problem is this level factor has 17 or 18 levels. So it's a bit of a, it's a lot to see. And I probably wouldn't summarize it like this. I would keep more likely the median and interquartile range. Um, but just so you get an idea, because none of these other variables were categorical, this is what it would show if you had a um, factor variable. And then we can look down here, like glucose and pressure are still median, interquartile range, tricep is mean and standard deviation, so it's insulin and age. Um, so you get a sense of the summaries of your data. Um, and then I have another example just showing you there are a lot of other uh, a lot of um, arguments in this function. You can change things like number of digits are shown here. It's, you can see that it's by default two, but you can make all of them show rounding up to two digits. Um, you can change the labels of any of your variables. You can change what it says for missing. Up here, it was showing unknown. Here, I'm telling it to say by missing or par missing parentheses, relabel that. Um, so you get a lot of customizations. Sometimes people are very particular about how they like their tables to be shown, or maybe a journal is very particular. So you can um, show it like this. You can even remove that missing row if you don't want to show it uh, or show it differently. So it's a very useful table building um, function. But there are a lot of other options. And I will show you another one 
after we talk about glue. Um, any questions so far? I will say there's not, I didn't put in, yeah. I have a question just about saving it. So a lot of times like mm -hmm. journals want modifiable files, like a mm -hmm. Word doc or whatever. Um, how can, I know you can, in an HTML file, you can save it to PDF, but like, what would you do for? I would probably, it depends on the journal um, and it depends on the output. I would probably knit it to a Word document and then save it like that because the um, the word output sometimes look, looks a little different than HTML. You can also copy and paste an HTML table into Word. Um, but yeah, that adds like a whole a whole step so that could go wrong. <laughs> um, I also have a section then later on showing you how to output tables to an Excel file, um, which sometimes journals also prefer that. So you have a couple options. But I'd say personally, I would write it to a Word document and then my PI would probably copy it into the, the document that someone's writing. Um, there's this whole idea of, of reproducibility and you don't, you wanna automate steps as much as possible, but honestly working with collaborators, there's always some hand step <laughs> that someone's copying and pasting something somewhere. So it's, it's pretty hard to get it fully automated. So I think that's usually what ends up happening, at least for me. Got it, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah, so we have, there is a way to save a GT table as a ping, a PNG. Um, yeah, that's true, I forgot. You can save some of these as images or like, um, yeah, image files that you can then use in different ways. I haven't done that, but I think that could be a useful thing. Um, I'll show you in a minute the Excel output, it looks quite different, but it has all the information in there. So at least that's useful. Um, nice, thanks. All right. Um, on the other note I was gonna say is that I don't have that many, I don't have any challenges in this one and I don't have that many like figure it out yourself, your turn type exercises, I have a few, um, but hopefully, yeah, definitely keep asking questions because I'm not exactly sure what what speaks to all of you the most. So let me know what, you, what you're what you most curious about. Um, so for glue, glue, actually, I think I put in your final a little bit sort of indirectly um, because it's so useful. I use it all the time. I haven't yet found a really good use for it in this class, but um, here's a kind of an example of how I tend to use it. So glue is, uh, the, the, the function is glue and the package is glue. So glue, glue. Um, and so this function helps us paste together pieces of strings um, along with code and, and our objects into those strings. So it can be very useful actually when summarizing data. And I think that's probably the most times when I use it. I also use it for uh, like creating file names uh, and so on. So super simple example is I have this string called name, which I said JM. And then the glue function, the way you, you read it is everything that becomes the string is in quotes. And then everything that is code goes in the brackets, the curly brackets. So name, name is that JM. And so I'm saying, telling it to evaluate that code inside the bracket. So what does this look like? It's a string, it says hello, eight, hello JM. And you can get more complicated. So here is a vector, just one, one to a hundred. And you can put inside those brackets our code. So for here, I'm saying I want to take the mean and then I want to take the median and I'm going to paste it inside the string that says the mean of my vec is blank and the median is blank. And so we can calculate all of that. And so we get those answers. Um, and you can go, uh, you, you can put lots of code. Here's an example um, of rounding. So here I, I divide or I basically multiply my vector times 0.001. So small number, small numeric decimals here. And if I run this glue, we can see the mean is that and the standard deviation is that and R has this habit of making a ton of uh, decimal values at the end of decimal points. So I wanted to round it to only show two digits. And that is exactly what I did. I rounded both of those. Um, so why would you need that? For example, um, a lot of times I'm making my own tables. Um, 
or not, uh, actually, I think in the final, you can kind of see an example of this where if I have, for example, like an odds ratio and a confidence interval, and I want to put them all together in one string, that's um, what I end up using glue for. So a kind of a similar idea, this example, I've just taken the penguins data, I grouped it by species, and then I calculated the mean bill length. So I'm just running this top code just so you can see, this is the data set I'm working with, a tibble, three rows, and then based on species, and then the mean bill length within the three species. Um, and so first I mutate this column. So I say, I'm gonna round it first. So mean bill now is the rounded version of mean bill. And then I add another column called description, which is a glue function. And I'll just run it just so you can see what happened. So we can see the species penguin. So it pulled in species, Adelaide, have a mean bill length of mean bill. And then that ends up being that column, 38.79 and then millimeters. So you can really make your own custom tables this way by using data in a data frame and then pasting it together to make some nice strings. Um, and that I think is a, is a very common usage of glue. And that's nice because um, there, there is another function that's just based our function called paste, um, but it, it's a lot harder to use because you have to, you really have to specify all this information. You like quote some things and then you put a comma and then you put the code and then you put another comma and then you put a quote. Um, but glue, the thing that glue does is it just puts it all together uh, and, and you just specify the code with the brackets. So I think that just is a lot more streamlined and easier to use than, than paste. And it is vectorized, which is why this works in a data sense um, inside mutate. Because if you think about, um, for example, I put a vector in that, I didn't just take the mean of this vector, I'm putting the vector inside those brackets. And glue knows how to deal with that. It made a vector with length 10 and put hello in front of each one of those. So um, if I save this as something, it's a glue, it's a glue is a type of string that it adds an attribute, but that's not that important. The important thing is that it's a character vector of length 10. And each of these are separate elements of that vector. Um, and so there's a whole vignette about ways to use glue that you can look at if you want more, but I'd say these are the more common ways to use it. And so you'll see an example later, but um, could the function add in the brackets? Um, yes, like if you wanted to show a bracket, if you do that, I think, I think if you put double brackets, what does that do? Yeah, so that doesn't evaluate, if you put double brackets, it doesn't evaluate the code, but it does put in a bracket. So I think you could do something like that. But like, yeah, so you could um, force brackets to show up if you need them. Yeah, that's a good question. Hopefully I understood that question properly. If not, let me know. I just wanted to show you here. So this is what I meant by this is glue code because inside table summary statistic asks for um, code that uses already like pre-specified statistics. Um, so mean and median and IQR and SD are already all uh, available. If you look at the help, it lists the ones that you can use. And so mean and SD are um, actually names of variables that are inside the table summary data. All right, so um, table one is another package. There are actually two table one packages out there. There's one that's table number one and table word one, <laughs> table one and table one. Um, I've used table, I used to use table one a lot. I think this was the kind of the original table one package. This is a newer one. I wanted to show this one because I, I kind of like the default way that it shows um, a lot of information at once if you're, if you're interested in that. So GT summary is useful for this. Um, table one is also useful. And so table one, it takes totally different uh, syntax for its arguments. It actually wants you to specify the, um, specify the names of the values as a formula. 
Um, and so remember when we talk about formulas in R, you have the tilde first. Um, oftentimes in, as we see in linear models, it's like you have your outcome or your dependent variable and then a tilde and then, a, and then all of your predictors. It's kind of like that um, where the tilde is saying, okay, here starts a function um, and that's what's happening. So these are all the predictors I wanna show. And then we use this line, the pipe, the, the vertical pipe that tells us we want to stratis, stratify by diabetes. And so if we look at this output, and I do have to specify the name of the, di name of the diabetes data set, um, you can see that default output is to stratify and then also show an overall column, which I like because I, I think that's also pretty common is to show both groups and then the overall. And then it also gives us like everything. So it gives us mean, standard deviation, median, min, max this time, not IQR, missing numbers um, and so on. Um, the default to show every kind of the shortcut, I mean, to show every value, every variable that's in your data is to use this dot, just so you know, rather than specifying every single um, name. But it is nice, it's kind of easy to just pick the ones you want um, and say them if you want. So this is the same, this is the same thing. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a question about glue, which is actually kind of hard. Um, so the question about glue is, does glue work inside as.formula? I think that it does, it should. Um, and actually, so the example you have is paste. I think anywhere that you use paste, glue should work um, is my sense. So I think so. Um, and so speaking of uh, kind of not glue, but like, well, so you have data, I guess. I think I was thinking, so when you have your data and you have your column names, usually they're not that informative. They're kind of hard to read. Um, and so when you have a table like this, you can go in and by hand relabel everything and say, I want to change this to say number of pregnancies. I want this to say glucose value after two hour fasting test or whatever it is. Um, and then you can do that for every variable. That is one way to do that. The other way is to have labels of your data. And we haven't talked about labels much other than I briefly mentioned in like class one or class two that often when you read in data from Stata or SAS, it comes with labels. Um, and that's kind of a nice thing because for instance, um, this column pregnant, that could really mean anything. But if we add this label to that column and I tell it that actually means number of pregnancies, that label is carried through to these different types of table functions. So table one and, and GG, G, GT summary tables, they will use that labeling information. Um, and one way to add a label is just use this label function. This label function is actually from table one um, but there are other packages that, that pull in the, it's, it's basically kind of a, a base R function that different packages use slightly differently. So I decided to do this in table one because I know table one has a label function that I can use. And I just labeled all of my data with the uh, information that makes it look more informative. It tells me the units, it tells me what it really is. And so I did that separately for each one. It's a little bit of typing, but you only have to do it once. Um, and if I run this, um, and notice I said Pima diabetes dollar sign pregnant. So you do have to pull out that value, that, that column. Um, I also changed my data a little bit. I added uh, another, um, diabetes column that instead of just pos neg, positive negative, it says specifically diabetes positive, diabetes negative. And the way I did that is I used the FCT recode function in the four cats. Um, four cats is the tidyverse factor package. And so to use recode, you do need a factor. So first I changed diabetes column to a factor. Previously it was just a character vector of pos and neg. Um, and then I told fact recode the things I wanted to change. So I, my new value is on the left and my old value is on the right. 
same here, negative, my diabetes negative is my new value, neg is my old value, kind of like in mutate where the, the new name goes on the left. And then I re-leveled that so that the fact re-level tells R which one goes first. So I want the positive to go first. Um, alphabetically by default, it says uh, N before P, so negative comes first, but um, I want positive to be my first level and I'll show you why in a little bit. And then I also created a new factor variable, actually not a factor variable, but a categorical variable called pregnant underscore ever, which is only a binary variable basically if pregnant is greater than zero. So ever pregnant and never pregnant. And then I added a label to that new variable because it didn't have a label since I just created it. Um, and so now my new table one, if we look at that, I changed my diabetes strata to be this new one, diabetes out, and then pregnant ever, I added that one in. It's a new, oops, I have to run this whole thing. Um, and so we can see, it looks a little nicer. Up here, I changed, I wanted diabetes positive to be first. That's why I told it to re-level that factor so that this one came first. And so we have positive, negative, and overall, we have all of these nicer labels for each of our values. And so this looks to me a little bit more publication worthy. You have nice labels and units and everything. Um, it's something a little bit more informative than the, the kind of shortened, simple names that we had. Um, another note is that you can stratify by two categorical variables. So we had our pregnant ever and diabetes out. We can put them together with this um, asterisk. And you can now, see, ooh, we can now see that there are four stratified categories along with overall. And then the last one, diabetes out, it still stratifies overall by, by that one. So we have this kind of multi-level stratification, which could make sense depending on what your data is, though for this case, it's a little bit uh, much. Um, Can I ask a quick, quick question? Yeah. For that categorical, the ever pregnant using if else, is it yes. gonna know, like if you have missing data, um, like if that one's just missing, is it gonna know? And then when you it stratify, will. like what it will, okay, you don't have to it say will. if, okay. If else knows how to deal with missing data, case okay. when doesn't really, you have to specify right. okay. when yeah. it's missing. Yeah, that is the one nice thing about if else is that it, it just automatically deals with missing data well. Yeah. Yeah, good question. That's always something to be a little worried about <laughs> for sure. But there wasn't any missing data in here um, in this one example. But yeah, that happens a lot. And I could look at I could do a kind of a simple table. Just I like to check when I make some a new thing, like a new categorical. Um, let's do that way. Just to see. So yeah, we can see all of my pregnant values that were zero are now um, over here. Never pregnant, and everything else got coded to an ever pregnant. And and table will show missing values, so we can see there was no missingness in that one. Yeah, any other questions? Um, the thing, <laughs> so that's good. Um, the other thing is that uh, those labels will now magically carry over to a lot of other things, um, including table summary. So if I were to run table summary now on that data because it has all the labels, I don't know why it's so slow. It's not usually so slow. I must have too many things running or something. Um, and it's showing me again, like all that, that labeling I put in, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, some things like I wouldn't show this row because I'm already stratifying by diabetes out. Um, it's kind of silly to show this diabetes. So I would probably remove that. Um, for, for table summary, I usually remove it before running it. Um, so I would select out that column and then it, table summary would show me the summary of all the other the columns that are left. Um, all right, so your turn. Um, 
I'm not going to break you out into breakout rooms, but maybe give you, let's do, let's take a break. Um, and if you want to think about this, you can, maybe let's come back at like 421-ish, give you a five-ish minute break, and then we'll talk about this one. So there's actually, there's a good question in the chat about this labeling business and whether it changes your actual variable names. Um, and it does not. So if you were to look at um, this like glimpse of that data now, the labels are not there, um, but they are, if you ask for, like let's say I want the label of pregnant, it will tell it to me. Um, <clears throat> so that's like kind of like an attribute that's hidden when you're looking at the data, but it shows up in functions that are built to use your labels. Um, you can actually see, I was just looking at the table summary help. There is a, an argument where you can specify the labels inside there as well. Like if you wanna change them. Um, I thought I could maybe override it, but I, I couldn't figure that out. But I think there are ways to, to either go back to the original variable names or just change the labels within there as well. All right, so. Did I start recording? Yes. Um, for this little puzzle, it's pretty simple. Um, one way to do that is to just do table summary by species. Um, and so we can see the penguins data. They're weirdly slow. I don't, I don't know why. Um, we now have, because we have three species, we now have three columns. So you can see it did the same kind of uh, stratification, though we have more categorical variables in here. So we have sex, we can see they're equally distributed basically across the, the sex or the species and um, year as well, the year that the measurements are taken. Um, and then islands, uh, like we saw in the function of the week, only some of these penguins live on certain islands. So Chinstrap is only on the Dream Island, Gentoo is only on the Visco Island, et cetera. All right, um, so switching gears a little bit, um, another important part of summarizing your data is this idea of what do we do with all this missing data and how do we evaluate it? Um, in the Pima diabetes data set, there are some missing data, which we could see in that table summary. Um, I'm just using my computer too much probably. Um, Unknown, unknown. So we saw like triceps has a big proportion of missing data. We could also add, there's a function in GT summary that says add N. And we'll see what that does. It adds a column. Um, like if you don't like this, this way of having a separate row for unknown, you could turn that off and show the N instead. This is showing me that there are 768. There's no missingness in the number of pregnancies, but in triceps, Fold thickness, there's only 541. And the insulin, there's only 397, 94. Oh, I guess insulin was the one that had the biggest missing data um, proportion. So there's ways to summarize it. Um, on the day part or week one or part week two, I can't remember. We I did show you this package in N-A-N-I-R, Nanier, I don't know how to say it, Nanier. <laughs> um, and there are various functions in there that deal with missing data and visualize it in certain ways. And so I think I showed you viz miss, viz underscore miss. Um, and that I spelled messiness wrong, but uh, it shows the degree of missing, I don't know. It shows the degree of missingness and then you can cluster by the amount of missingness. So in this case, I'm showing the missing data in, in PIMA in diabetes data. I'm telling you to sort by missingness, which means put the variables in order of the proportion missingness. And you'll see why that, that's useful. And then I'm also telling you it's a cluster. So it clusters the rows. Actually, let me just run it without these um, functions, without these arguments first. So this is the default. You can see it just sorts them in the order that they are in your data. So we have pre pregnant and then triceps and insulin are in the middle and we can see there's quite a bit of missing data, which is what those dark shaded rows are saying. So all of the dark rows are saying are missing values in those uh, variables. But if I sort and I cluster, I get a bit of a little bit nicer plot. 
um, because it tells me first that insulin has almost uh, 49% missing. Triceps is about 30%. Pressure is only about 5% and the rest have kind of minimal negligible missingness. And it groups them, it clusters the rows. So what I can see here is that when someone has a missing value for insulin, they also very likely have a missing value for tricep uh, width, thickness or whatever it was. Um, so that makes sense. Maybe whenever they went in for their insulin measure, they also measured the tricep thickness or um, there's some sort of relationship and missingness there. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. And uh, this gives you a sense of the values or the variables that have the most missingness. It also gives you down here that overall the missing is about 8% of the, of the data considering like the full row by column number of, of cells and about 92% are there. So that's pretty good. But if you think about what happens when you run an analysis, for example, and you include the valuable, the variable insulin, by default, R is only gonna look at your complete case data, which means rows that only have full data. So if I'm running a model and insulin is my predictor, it's only looking at this bottom half of the data. You're throwing away half of your data. So it's something to both um, be aware of and then sometimes possibly be careful about. Um, <clears throat> so if we looked at, for instance, um, table one that would have shown us also that information, missingness um, in that, uh, yeah, in insulin is about 50%. We can also see the missingness by diabetes status and see that it's pretty similar, which is a good thing. We don't seem to have like if you had 90% missing insulin in your negative diabetes group, that would be kind of alarming because it would mean that missing data is related to your outcome and you wouldn't want to um, just ignore that fact. Um, you probably wouldn't get a very good picture of what's really going on. So it's good to look at percent missingness. It's good to look at it stratified by any super important variables or outcomes. Um, but overall, these, all of these variables look pretty similar across diabetes status, which is good. Um, and this, this, these two are the main um, kind of big, big missing values to be aware of. That chart uh, that shows the missing, can you stratify that by like, say you had like five years, could you stratify that and see if there were trends over years? Yes. Yes. Cool. Let me see. I love this. <laughs> yes. I think this is this one. Yes. I know I was going to, I wanted to find some longitudinal data. Maybe for next class, I'll find some longitudinal data, but that for, I would use this plot. So this is GG miss FCT, which I think is by a factor because the factor here I picked was diabetes. And so it's kind of a, it's similar. It's, I think you can do this by, I haven't figured I haven't like played around with this lately, but I think you can do this by a factor, but I would probably use this one because this is telling me percent missingness. It's basically that table in a visualization form. Um, and so you can see like if I had year one, year two, year three or four on the, the X axis and I had all my variables, I could see if the, is the percent missingness changing. Like oftentimes you have dropout. And so you get, as you go along in time, you get more percent missingness in certain variables than others. Um, I think there might be a way to show this also stratified by, I mean, you could kind of force it and then just say filter um, diabetes equals negative and show it separately. But I think there is a way to do it stratified as well. I'll try and look for that. Um, so this has a, this, this is nice for seeing like patterns of missingness, how they go kind of together when they're missing. This is nice for seeing, is there a pattern in like say over time or across a factor in terms of how much missingness is there. So they have their, their own uses. And you can see like the, the insulin is, is way off the chart compared to these others, which are very minor amount of missingness. Um, and there's other ways to kind of explore what's going on with your missingness is kind of infinite ways to, to look at this. Um, I, something I might be interested in is looking at what is, what is the distribution of my variables when insulin is missing? For example, 
is insulin tend to be missing in people with very high glucose levels? Probably not. It's probably, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe people with low glucose don't go in to get their insulin levels checked. Um, so something to kind of evaluate that way, this is one way you might do that. So um, first of all, I create a new data set. This is my original data set. And then I add a column insulin missing, which is just a, a true false variable in this case, is dot na insulin. So it's true if, if insulin is missing, false if it's not. And I just call that temp, dat, temp data for now. And then I also want to make this longer so that I can make, I want to pivot it longer so I can make a ggplot out of all of the, va the variables that I'm interested in. Um, so I use pivot longer. The columns, let me run this and show you again what it looks like. Temp data, we have all of these columns. What I'm saying is take pregnant to age. So all of these, I don't want to take um, diabetes or any of these categorical variables. So I'm just sweeping across all the columns from pregnant to age, which includes everything in the middle. Um, and so I want the column name. So I want a new column that's going to be categorical and the, the values are going to be pregnant, glucose, pressure, triceps, insulin. It's going to be all of those column names. And so those column names go to the names to argument. I'm going to call that new column variables. It's in quotes because it's a new column I'm creating. And then all the values, everything in the data in those columns, the values go to a new column called values. So pivoting, as you'll see, creates this long data. All of the other categorical variables stuck around, diabetes and everything. Then we have variables is my new column because I called it variables. And then I'm gonna scoot over here. This is values is my new column. Column. So the first person was had pregnant six, uh, was a value of six. They had six pregnancies. They had a glucose of 148. Um, and then it just keeps going. And so the reason I did that is so that I could then facet on variables. Um, and what I wanna show is essentially the distribution of all of those variables stratified by whether insulin is missing or not. So my X value, I'm gonna show a density plot. And geom density, um, I think we saw very early on in our function of the week, creates a, a density, a, a smooth histogram essentially. And um, it needs the X values to be the numeric value that you're showing the density of. And so that's my new values column. And then I told it I wanna make the color of the line stratified by whether insulin is missing. Um, so I'll show, just run that without, without faceting. So it's kind of a bizarre plot. And that's because I have a lot of different columns in there. I have many different variable measurements. And so I need to facet wrap or facet grid or whatever by that variables column that I made. So here we can see if I do that, now my variables included all the column names that I had in the original data, like age, glucose, insulin, mass, et cetera. I have the distribution of all of those. I made the scales equal to three so that they it can be allowed to, to change the X and Y axis, depending on what value I'm looking at. And uh, the color is whether it's missing or not. So we can see insulin only has a red line because um, missingness, when it's not missing, we have data. When it is missing, we don't have data. So we can't have a blue line there, but everything else has a blue line. And so I just wanted to kind of skim and look and see, is there anything kind of um, unexpected? I guess the first thing I noticed is that in people who have missing insulin values, they tend to be older because the distribution of the blue line has more mass over in the higher ages. That might be interesting. Um, they tend to have higher number of pregnancies. Um, so if they, uh, the blue line again has more mass over in the higher numbers. Um, the pedigree function tends to be lower in those women who have missing insulin values. Nothing too striking, but it is just something kind of good to look at. Sometimes a paper will come back and people, the reviewers will ask, well, what does what, what the missing data look like that you removed from your analysis? Are they different 
than the people you left in your study. And so this is kind of one way to answer that. The other way, more numerically, is to actually make a table. And I'll show you how to do that. But I like to see it visually first, just because it gives me an idea of what's going on. Um, and you also get a sense of the distribution of the variables too. Pedigree is, is very skewed. Um, pressure, this is blood pressure, is, is usually very normally distributed and it is here as well. Glucose too, it doesn't look so bad. Um, so the way I would show a table is to make one of those table ones. However, the way I like to take, make a kind of summarized table, but I would statify instead by insulin missing. Um, so if I do that, we get eventually a table that shows when insulin is, is not missing is the false and when insulin is missing is the true. So again, like I was saying, it looked like age was older for people that had missing values of incident in insulin, which is true. Um, what else did I say? I don't remember now. Um, you can look at the diabetes distribution between them is similar. Um, Oh yeah, the number of pregnancies. Yeah, the number of pregnancies was higher in people who had missing values for insulin as well. But glucose looks similar, blood pressure, tricep thickness, all that looks similar. Um, the diabetes pedigree function was slightly lower and so on. So that is one way to answer that question. Um, of course, if you have a lot of missing data, this could get complicated, but it is um, useful sometimes to look at these kind of distributions. Um, and, and the good thing is, is that it doesn't seem to be related to our outcome, which I think is the most important question, diabetes positive versus negative. Any questions about that? The last um, kind of plot from this package that I like to show, I like to use sometimes is geoma miss point. So if we are plotting, say, just a scatter plot of insulin versus glucose, um, those should be pretty correlated, which they are. Here I've stratified it by using facet wrap on diabetes outcome, um, similar kind of association, positively correlated. Um, that looks good, but we know that there's a lot of insulin data missing. Um, and so one way to actually see that is to use, instead of geom point, use the geom miss point, which is in the Nanier package. And so just running that, you can see the difference. It's the same, the blue points are the same points that were up here, but now for all those missing in, um, insulin values, they put them essentially off the plot, like on the, on the border outside of the main um, plotting area. So they're all piled up here, we can see you get a sense of distribution of glucose in those missing variables. We can see that there was somebody that had a very low glucose value in the diabetes positive and had missing insulin, but most of them had glucose values between 100 and 200. And then over here, kind of a wider range for negative diabetes patients. So this can be useful. There were some, um, I think if, oh, actually that's, that's I, I misspoke. Actually, I think what's happening here is that these people were missing in both, both glucose and insulin. That by default, if there's someone that has missing in both, they get put in this little lower corner. So I think that actually, it's not that they had a low glucose, it's that it was missing. Um, and then here, I think there was a similar situation. This might, I think actually have had missing glucose, but insulin was small. This is what's going here. So it's not a super, it's not a super clear plot, but I think it's nice just to get a sense of what that missing data might look like and if it's if it's informative in some way. Um, so I use that occasionally, just kind of good to know about. Um, and then like a an aside about how to deal with missing data um, for this class, and I'd say for a lot of analyses, we often just ignore it and assume that it's missing at random and that it doesn't really. Um, it's not going to influence our models or our association. Oftentimes that's not a good assumption, but sometimes it's all we can do. Um, but just so you know, just thinking about it, if we think about this data has how many rows? It has 768. Um, if we run a linear regression, let's just say insulin is our outcome, glucose is our predictor. Um, we saw how to fit a linear regression with the linear 
the LM function, we can look at that output and it's telling us 375 observations deleted due to missingness. So by default, R is just gonna only look at your complete case data, rows that have full um, observations in any variables that you're looking at. Um, so um, to kind of pull out that information from like in a table, like if you needed that information to use it later, you can use glance on fit LM and that will give us a little bit more summary statistics about our model. And if we scroll over here, we can see the number of observations that we used for that model were 398. So we have that information, we can pull it out of a model if we're not sure, and uh, it's all there for us. Um, and then we can also have calculated this ourselves because what it's doing is dropping NA. So drop NA drops the rows that have missingness in insulin and glucose. So if we do that and then count the number of rows, we end up with 393, which is what was up here. So what happens if I wanted to include all of those variables in the model? It's gonna use um, complete case on everything, which is equivalent to saying drop NA for every column that I have. And in that case, we only lose one more person, um, which actually was probably this person here, maybe. Um, or no, I don't know. Actually, no, it's probably missing in some other variable. Um, but so that's actually not that much different, but sometimes it is. Sometimes you end up with very small numbers if you're using all complete case data um, for everything. So just kind of be aware, it's good to check how much missing you're losing, how much, how many rows you're losing in each analysis. <clears throat> and it's something that's not often reported in publications as like a statistical reviewer of papers. Often one of my comments is, was there any missing data? And what did you do with it? Is like kind of a simple question that I have to ask a lot because it's something that people don't report and it can be important. Um, and there are other ways of dealing with missing data. I just wanna let you know that R has many, many um, packages that will deal with missing data. A common way is what's called imputation. So you fill in missing data with certain values. Um, kind of a widely accepted method is called multiple imputation by chained equations, also known as MICE. And there, there's a lot of information out there. There's a really good book that's out there for free. I would recommend reading that if you're interested in imputation. And there's a MICE package in R, which has a lot of good kind of help manuals and vignettes and there's workshops on this. So I really recommend if you're, if you're dealing with missing data and you need to know how to do imputation to kind of to deal with it this way. Um, I also know that Stata has a really good MICE uh, implementation. So if you're a Stata user, it's also, I, th I think some people like it even better. So there's another option for you, but this is, this is like a whole class. So if you need it, maybe take a class <laughs> or read a textbook, I don't know. Um, but it is a whole important subject. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, so the, there was a comment that said someone who was a biostats alum wished that she had learned imputation. I also wish I had learned imputation in my PhD program and I did not. Um, I, I learned like basic stuff about it, but I didn't learn how to implement it. So it is, it's something that we kind of don't think about until we need it. And then when we need it, uh, we wish we knew how to do it. <laughs> so if you have a chance, I think Jody Lapidus, one of the professors did a missing data reading course last year. So maybe that will happen again sometime. But yeah, we don't have an actual class on that right now. I don't think it is useful. Um, all right, just one aside is I was looking through all my code to try to find a few useful things for you to, to see. Um, and I realized that a lot of times I use GT summary, but a lot of other times I use another package called Final Fit. Um, and they're similar, but quite different in the way that you write the code. GT summary is simpler. Final fit has, has like a whole uh, language of ways to fit models. So if you're interested, I would just check out their vignette and get a sense of whether you like the way they do things better. Some of their tables are very nice looking um, and, and they actually have easy ways to paste together like cohort summaries and regression output together, which is why I tend to use it. So look at this link if you wanna 
go on that deep dive. But for now, I'm just going to show you GT summary stuff. <clears throat> um, okay, so what time is it? I think we'll just keep going with some regression and have a break in a little bit. Um, so today, we'll see how far we get on some of these stats models. I'll probably just finish what we don't. Like last class, we'll just be finishing what we haven't finished yet and maybe a couple other bonus facts, but um, we'll see how far we get. So starting out again with linear regression, which we talked about last class, um, we saw the LM function and how we use formulas to specify our model. Mm. So in this regression, actually, I, I flipped the outcome. So now the outcome is glucose because it's actually a little more normally distributed. So I thought that was better. And then insulin is my predictor versus another model where we put in a few other predictors, age, pressure, blood pressure, BMI, pregnant ever. And so if we fit two models, we can use broom tidy to see the output in a table. So I'm gonna run those two models. I save them as two objects. And then tidy shows me the, the model output, um, which we could make, we could use mutate and GT and make those all nice looking, but probably just to make a simple um, regression output, I'll use the GT summary table regression function, which makes them, if we just look at this one, it makes a nice regression output table. So that was the simple univariate model where we just had the one predictor, which shows us the estimate of the covariate coefficient, which is also the beta, which shows a confidence interval and a p-value um, altogether. And if we want to show two models at once, we can save the table regression output into two different objects. And then table merge is the function that will put them together. So you input into the argument tables, a list of all the, the regression tables you want to put in. And so this is, the, again, the output from table regression. So this was the first model. This is the second model. You can also optionally, you don't have to do this, but you can name your columns. So this one I called the univariable model. This one I called the multi, multiple linear model. And if I run this whole thing, actually, this is a bad sign. My computer is about to just die. Um, we have, it's nicely lined up for us. It shows us the two models side by side. It shows us insulin was in both models and the coefficient didn't actually change very much, um, which is somewhat, I mean, it's a small beta in general, but it didn't change much when we added in these other risk factors. We can see that BMI is not significant. And if we use a p-value cut off of 0.05, it's very not significant. Um, we can see ever pregnant was my categorical variable. Um, I like this about GT summary is it shows you the, the reference group. So we saw today uh, thinking about factors and what what the order of your factors and how that um, how that can change, how we can change it using the forecasts package. We also saw how that can change your plots. Um, and that can also, in the same sense, change your model. So here, because ever pregnant was the first, alphabetical category in this variable, that becomes what we call our reference group. And so this estimate of 4.8 is saying that the, the expected mean difference in glucose comparing someone who was never pregnant versus someone who was pregnant at least once is expected to be about 4.8 on average of whatever the measurement of glucose was. Um, and maybe that is what you want. You wanna compare never pregnant to ever pregnant, but if you wanna switch it, if you wanna change the reference value in your model, that's where you would use factors and change the, the levels of your factors. Um, and so if we look at the data, pregnant ever was actually a character um, vector. So by default, what R is doing behind the scenes is it first converts that to a factor um, and then it uses the, the like default levels. Um, so we need to actually use the factor type functions to change up our levels however we want. Um, so just a simple example of the function I'm gonna use. 
which is FCT relevel. Let's just make a very simple um, character vector first. So this is my vec, ABC, AB. If I turned it into a factor, by default, it alphabetizes those. So we look at the levels and they're A, B, C. That makes sense. But factory level takes as an argument the factor, variable, and then whatever level I want to be my reference group. And so if I use that, it's in the forecast package. All these FCT underscore functions are in the forecast package. Now, if we look at the levels, B is first, and then it just left everything the same way. And so if I run a model on this, if my categories are B, A, C, it's going to show me A versus B and C versus B. That might make sense if you have like three categories. And, and like we talked about this, this earlier in class, if this is your biggest category, maybe it makes sense to compare A versus B and C versus B. Or maybe B is like the middle category um, and you want to compare low versus medium and high versus medium or something like that. Um, so it often, I would say changing your factor level happens a lot because it really changes the interpretation of your model and what estimates you get out. Um, so let's do that. Let's change our pregnant ever to have the, the reference to actually be never pregnant, which um, might make more, make more sense. So I take my data, first I change it into a factor, and then I say factory level and make never pregnant my reference group. So if I run that, you know, I refit the exact same model. Um, I save the table regression here. It's a table regression output from GT summary. And then I merge those tables again. I didn't rerun the first model because I didn't need to. If I look at it now, we can see never pregnant is aligned with the um, line. Like it's the reference group. This is saying it's the reference group. And then we end up with ever pregnant. It's the same beta, but it's sign is flipped. And that's because we now expect a decrease in glucose levels comparing ever pregnant versus never pregnant. The size is the same because it's just a linear, um, it's a linear model. So it's, it's all it did was take the opposite comparison. So instead of an increase in 4.8, now we have a decrease expected in 4.8, which makes sense. Um, but it can change a lot more if you're doing like a logistic regression or something like that, where it's not, um, if you're looking at odds ratios and so on. So that can make a difference in, in what you're reporting if you change your factor level. It's the same model, same p-value, same estimates. It's just what you're, what you're seeing changes when you change the reference value. Whoa. Um, any questions about that? That's kind of an odd R thing, I'd say. It's changing, changing factors, changing your reference value in a model. Um, something that happens a lot. Okay, so um, something I want to show you a couple times today, um, there's this idea in statistics is whether the difference between inference and prediction. So when we fit a model, oftentimes we're thinking in terms of inference, we're trying to estimate some sort of effect size or an average. Um, we put a confidence interval around it, we get a p-value. Um, and this is all telling us information about our underlying population, which is what we call statistical inference. Um, but other times we're more interested in prediction, which means we're using our models to predict future values based on new data, based on a new person shows up to the clinic and there's some risk score for diabetes and we, we, we calculate their risk score and we're saying you have a risk of having diabetes in the next 10 years of 10%, something like that. So that's this idea that prediction, the, the end goal of prediction is different than the end goal of statistical inference. Um, and so there's a lot to consider when you're thinking about that, but I did wanna show you just how you might pull out predicted values from a model because it is useful to know how to do. Um, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, if we were doing, for instance, a, li a linear regression, I'll show that example first. If we look at the model, we see this is our kind of smallish model. It has insulin, age, blood pressure, BMI. So if I um, went into a clinic, they would calculate my insulin measure, my age, my blood pressure, my BMI, and then 
use this linear risk score. So multiply 0.13 times my insulin value plus 0.61 times my age plus 0.2 times my blood pressure plus 0.23 times my BMI. And we think of that as like our best guess at the average glucose level. Because since we're doing linear regression and glucose is our outcome. So in this case, we're trying to predict, well, what do you think my glucose level is based on my other values? Um, and so to pull out a prediction estimate, there's a way to do that in Broom. So we've been showing you tidy a lot because um, that makes a nice tibble out of our, 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 our regression or model output. But there's another function in Broom called augment. And what augment is all about is making predictions. There are many other ways to do this in, in R, probably in your biostats class, you learned like the predict function, or I don't even know, I've forgotten since I haven't done it in a while, but there are many other ways. Um, first thing I wanted to do is just think about uh, what, what is in our data. So if we look at, um, before we use augment, if we look at our data and I group by, let's just say by diabetes, and I summarize across these values, which were in my model, um, including my outcome. And I calculate the mean and I take out the missing values. And then I round just to show you uh, a little easier. These are my mean values. And so what I wanna say is, okay, what if someone walks in to the clinic and has average values similar to this? Um, we would expect probably if the model fits well that their glucose value should be around the observed mean glucose value, like 110. Um, and if someone walked into the clinic with values like this, if the model fits well, fits our data well, we're probably gonna predict uh, an expected value of glucose around 142, right? So this is like this idea that um, we're using our data pr to predict the mean glucose value of a population. And so augment, if I give it a new data set, so I've created a new data set with two people. And the first person I said, their insulin is 130, they're 35, their blood pressure is 70, and their BMI was 30, which I just sort of guesstimated from here. I gave them, the two people had the same age or 35, but I changed their insulin values. This person is more like a diabetic person in this data set, and this person is more like a uh, non-diabetic person in our data, just, just as an example. So let, what does this data look like? Just so I can show you. It's a tibble. I have four columns, insulin, age, blood pressure, mass. So what I wanna know is based on these values, what are these two people's expected glucose values? And augment takes our model, the model object, which is somewhere, where did I put it? Up here this, the output from our LM, fit LM final. That's our first argument. And the second argument or another argument is new data. And so I've put my tibble in here as my new data. And if I run this, it spits back the same stuff, but it gives me a new column called fitted. And so what it's saying is our model, our linear regression model has predicted that a person like this will have a glucose value of 120.8. And then a person like this will have a glucose value of 133. So that is our prediction. And from a linear model, it's a predicted mean of a population. So that's about <clears throat> kind of in terms of prediction, we're predicting the mean glucose of someone like that. Um, and we can see the person that was more like the diabetic cohort was has does have a higher um, glucose value than that person that was more like the non-diabetic cohort. That makes sense. It predicted these to be different, one higher than the other. Um, we could also have augmented using just the original data set. So you don't actually have to put in new data. If you just say augment on your model and save that output, I've saved it as my data. I should really call this like predicted data, but whatever. Um, what happens is it gives you the data. It's it's given me this row names because if you remember, we have missing data. So it's removed some of our rows. So it's just helping us out there. And then it has all our original data. And then it gives us the fitted values. We also get residuals, which is the difference between our fitted and our observed outcome. So 80 
minus 106 is about negative 17. Um, and then we get a lot of other stuff that is related to residuals, which you will learn about if you take a regression class. Um, so useful information, but I'm not going to get to that. So I'm more interested in my fitted values and my residual values and, and what's going on here. Like, is this model, does this model work? So I could plot, I could calculate my own residuals if I wanted. Um, but here, I'm just going to plot the fitted values uh, against my glucose values just to see how that looks. We would expect, if this was a perfect model, we would expect a perfect line. We would want our fitted, fitted values to be exactly the glucose values. Um, we're not going to get that from a linear regression. This is, it's impossible. But you want to see something close to that. And we do see it's, you know, it's not so bad. You get kind of close. Um, that there's still a lot of noise. It's not, we're not, we're not going to do, we're not going to make a magic model out of this, but it is something to look at. Um, another kind of diagnostic plot that some people recommend looking at when you run a model is to look at the residuals, which is the fitted value, so our prediction, um, the difference between that and our observed value that we're trying to predict. So I can calculate that myself, although that it does give me the residuals, but I just to show you explicitly what that is. Um, and here I've fit that and, or I've, I've uh, shown the scatter plot of that against one of my predictors, in this case, insulin. Um, so generally you, you don't wanna see a kind of a trend or a pattern. You wanna see this line, the smoothing line to be pretty flat. Um, and it, it's fine, it is, it's, I don't know. It's not perfect, but it's not too bad. Um, you can get those plots out of the, the, this model. I think I showed you this last time. If you run plot of linear regression, you get these kind of diagnostic plots out. Um, and it's going to be more fitted values against residuals. You, you also want to see a flat line there um, instead of just one of them. So similar, you can make these plots in ggplot using the augment, augmented data. You could calculate standardized residuals and all of that. So I just wanted to show you that it's possible. Cook's distance is also showing up in our augment data. Um, so it's all there. Tidy has made it well, has made it easy to pull out that information. Um, and then, then in terms of prediction versus classification, I want to um, get to that when we talk about logistic regression. So you, you may have heard of like machine learning classifiers or classifier models um, and that that we can see when we have a binary outcome. But just from a linear regression standpoint, prediction is all about getting those fitted values, which is like your, your linear predictor out of your data. Um, so that is useful. Um, one thing I do wanna show you is that kind of another off topic, but useful aside, is how to write out these tables. So there were questions earlier about, can we output these tables to a Word document, which my answer is to knit to a Word probably, um, but we can also write them to files. Any kind of table that you can convert to a data frame or a tibble, you can easily write to a CSV file or an Excel file. Um, so for example, let's just say I wanted to write out my table one. So the first thing, the first thing I would do is turn it into a tibble. So here's my Pima diabetes table summary by diabetes. I've added as tibble here. And so you can see what it's done. It's made it not so pretty because it's not nice HTML output, but you have all the information in there. You have the, the median and intercortile range. You have the unknowns, you have the two columns for positive and negative. Um, the table one package can similarly be saved as a tibble. And so I could just write that using write CSV or write TSV or write Excel, whatever, and I can save it as a file. So if I look at that file now, where do I put it in results? This one, um, and I, can, I could open that in Excel and it would look like a table. Um, another way that I sometimes use to output a lot of tables at once is this function in a package called OpenXLS, XLSX 
called write.xlsx. So this is what it sounds like. It's writing to an, a .xlsx file, which is an Excel file. But the nice thing about this function is you can write a list of tables and it will make a tabbed Excel sheet. So if I'm working with a collaborator and they want like 10 different stratified tables, um, or if I'm trying to write a paper and I wanna put a supplementary table together, I will often do something like this where I have a list of tables. In this case, I have my table one and my table regression. So let me run this table regression and then I'll show you what it looks like. Um, so this is an Excel file, it's actually already here. If I open this in Excel, somewhere, lost all of my stuff. Um, there we go. Hmm. Too many. Oh, it's just like really tiny over here. Okay. <laughs> so here it is. So you can see it's not beautiful, but the relevant information is there. It would work for a supplementary table. It could also work for a, just sharing with a, some collaborators. Um, but it it gives you by a very kind of quick and easy way to output things to different tables. And the, the sheet names or the tab names are what I what I called my list names. Um, so that I use a lot. Um, I also gave another example where I tend to use glue um, inside a file name. So if I wanna append today's date, for example, so glue, if I just run this glue part, you can see it used the today function to pull out today's date. And then it saved, if I run this file, which I've already done, it saves it as a file with the date in it. So I can find it later because sometimes I'm doing versioning and just in case it's always good to save it like that. So I do that sometimes, um, just a tip. So, any no other questions? Um, all right, ANOVA. I didn't really want to talk about ANOVA because I don't really use ANOVAs that often, but I know a lot of you probably do, especially the biologists in the room. Um, and ANOVA is, there's strangely several functions in R that do essentially the same thing. I don't know why there have to be so many. I find it confusing. Um, there's AOV, capital ANOVA, lowercase ANOVA, um, I think I use AOV the most often, but I'm showing you both here, AOV and capital A ANOVA. Um, and there's also two kind of fundamental ways to run an ANOVA. You can specify your outcome and your uh, factors like in a formula or kind of like we do with linear regression, or you can fit a linear regression model first and then put that inside your ANOVA code. Um, so I created some categorical variables in my data just so I can have some factors to work with because the Pima diabetes data didn't really have any. So I created one, which is age greater than 35, and I made it a factor. And so this one times age greater than 35 means that it's going to be the number one when someone is older than 35, and it's going to be the number zero when someone is younger or equal to 35. And then I made it a factor. So it has factors level zero and one. And then I used case when to make a pregnancy category. So if someone was pregnant equals zero, then they become a zero. If they had between zero and three pregnancies, or sorry, one and three, it'd be um, between one and three. If they had more than that, then they got a three plus. And if they were NA, there's actually no NA, but I just, in case you need to know what to do with NAs, then you also make that an NA. And then I made that a factor. So just kind of artificially dichotomizing and categorizing my data. What are those? What's what's going on here? What's the cross table for that? Um, decent amount and people, uh, let's add the title. And what is the title? I should adorn title. Yeah, typing. Is pregnancy category on the top? So we have zero, one to three, and three plus, and then we have age, zero, one. Um, so this is the smallest group of 13 people, but there's a decent number in the rest of the groups. Um, and just thinking about, so ANOVA, you have a continuous outcome, you have some categorical factors, um, and you're thinking about whether or not your 
continuous variable differs between those groups. So here I just have a simple box plot. First, I've put pregnancy category on the x-axis. On the y-axis is glucose. That's our continuous variable. That's our outcome. And then I colored or I filled the box plots by age. Um, so we can kind of see there does seem to be an age difference. Um, people who are older tend to have higher glucose levels on average, except for this group, people who have never been pregnant, they're a lot similar, but of course there's correlation between number of pregnancies and age. So teasing that out is a little more difficult, but just observations looking at the data, that's what I see. Um, so what does the ANOVA tell us? We can first run a, just a one factor ANOVA based on age. So like I said, ANOVA, the AOV function is one way to run an ANOVA and you put it in the same format as the LM function where you have your outcome tilde um, predictor vector and then your data. I should actually just say data equals. And if we run that, this is what we get. That is not really that informative. We get the sum of squares, degree of freedom. Okay, not that useful. What we really want is the summary of that, which gives us a p-value. And so like I said last time, this is just a print statement. What this really is, is a list of a ton of different stuff. And so if I wanna get out that information, I need to deal with the list. Um, so that is why Groom Tidy was invented because what all we have to do is tidy the AOV output and we end up with that same stuff, but in a tibble. It's a little easier to work with. Um, so if I wanted to pull out the p-value, I could. Um, the way I would do that probably is just to say like filter term equals age gr35, pull p-value. So that's my overall ANOVA p-value. It's, it's just a two category factor. So it's not actually that fancy, but is the p-value for that factor. Um, so that's what you get from an ANOVA. Get the sums of squares. Um, and so you could do the exact same thing here by fitting the linear regression first and then saying AOV on top of that. There's not really any benefit to doing it one way or the other. In this case, you get the same answer. You get the same sums of squares, the same p-value, same residuals, et cetera. Um, it gets a little more complicated when you have more than one factor. If you want an interaction, so let's say you have two factors, A and B, and you also want the interaction to test the interaction between A and B, you would use the asterisk. Um, and so in R, when we say something like Y tilde A times B, that's, that's actually um, shorthand for A plus B plus A, in, in R it's A colon B, and A colon B is the multiplicative interaction term. So we can see that here I've put an interaction between age and pregnant cat. And let me actually just let me show the fit summary first. So you can see um, that's the linear model output. We get this interaction term. And because pregnant cat has three categories, we get two interaction terms because of the dummy variables. Again, there's a lot of stats speak I'm going through that I'm not explaining well because it would take forever. But this idea that when you have a categorical variable, you have dummy variables. So you get this category compared to the zero category, this category compared to the zero category, which is our reference category. And then we have our age greater than 35, one. I really hate the way that our outputs this because it's so confusing. Um, but what this is saying is one versus zero, one versus zero, one versus zero. It's terrible. Um, but we're focused on ANOVA. So let's look at the ANOVA from that model. And we get, now we have, since we have two factors in the interaction term, we get three rows in our sums of squares. We can see the p-value for the interaction term is not significant. So there's not really evidence of like a differential effect, even though the plot kind of look like there might be, it's gonna be not seeing it statistically. Um, though the thing to be careful with R, and if you're used to using something like SAS, um, I'm not sure what state it is. It depends if you're taking in a class about ANOVA, the types of sums of squares are gonna give you different p-values. 
Um, so you have your type one, type two, type three sums of squares, and it's a different test here, right? It's, it's testing something different depending on the type of sums of squares you're calculating. R, I believe, yeah, R gives you type one sums of squares, whereas SAS, I believe, gives you type three sums of squares. So if you run the same model in SAS versus R, you will get different output, but you can manipulate either one to show you the same thing. It's just something to be aware of. Um, so looking at this model with the interaction term, because this is not significant, we might wanna take that out. So let's just have the two factor ANOVA without the interaction term and run that and look at that output. It's actually the same. It's just removed that row. Um, the degrees of freedom at the bottom and residuals changed, but the, this part stayed the same. And that's because this is the test of the interaction conditional on including those other factors, right? So once we remove it, those p-values didn't stay the same. Or those p-values stayed the same because all we did was remove that last sequential test. Um, so this again has to do with the type one versus type three, sums of squares, type one, sums of squares is sequentially adding in each of these factors and then testing them. Um, so if I change the order, here is age first, here's pregnant first, these are different. So if pregnancy is first, we get very significant because nothing else was in the model. Um, but if we do this one, we get age is very significant. And then we add in pregnancy, it's not really that significant because it didn't add much more information. So this is another reason why I don't like to do ANOVA because I find it confusing and easy to get wrong. Um, but just be aware of what you're doing. Um, and then a side note, you can change which sums of squares you get, but you have to use the capital A ANOVA in the car package. So if you want type three sums of squares, you can ask for it in the same way, fit an ANOVA on top of a linear regression, but say type equals three, um, and then you end up with different p-values here because it's different tests. So this time, if you run them flipped, um, you end up, well, if I had run this flipped, that's what I meant to do. The order of your predictors or your factors are switched. You should get the exact same test statistics and p-values looking here. Age is very, very significant. Pregnant cat has p-value 0.053. Um, so that's a way if, you know, if but I think the only time this really comes up is if you're doing a very rigorous kind of basic science three factor um, model, like if you've designed your study this way, um, in terms of like epidemi epidemiology and cohort studies, the reason why I don't use ANOVA much is because I'm often doing just an observational study and linear regression is what I want to use for that. And ANOVA is equivalent to linear regression anyway, so it's all the same. You can get all the same tests out if you need it. Um, related to that, if we look at the linear regression table from the two factor, essentially ANOVA or the linear model with age plus pregnant cats, we can see the linear model breaks it down into the two categories. So the ANOVA, because it's an ANOVA, it's giving us the global p-value from that three category. It's testing whether that is significantly associated with glucose, conditional on the other values, the other age value, um, but as a whole across all three categories. Whereas linear regression by default gives you the comparisons between one and three and three plus compared to zero. So we can see actually that we do see, if we look at the pairwise comparisons, that the difference really is in between the kind of low pregnancy numbers compared to zero, Whereas once you get past three plus, the p-value is 0.3, it's not significantly different from people who had no preg pregnancies. So you see a little bit more information. Um, though ANOVA, because of, of the global p-value, you kind of prevent this idea of multiple testing where we have a lot of p-values in our model and where um, we might have inflated type one error. So there's a trade-off there doing the global test versus looking individually at the, the categories. But I'd say most people are actually interested in 
the pairwise differences rather than the full global test of the full three category model. Um, but I think I showed last time you can add the global p value if you want. So if I add global p to the table regression, I get that 0.053. That was from the ANOVA, it's the same thing. Um, so you can see that the test of that factor as a whole, the global test is a p value 0.05. So long story short, ANOVA linear regression, you can get the same information out. Um, ANOVA is confusing and it's not, it's a little messy in our, <laughs> just, to, just so you know. Um, but take a stats class to learn all about that. The last bit of ANOVA is that usually people want to do the pairwise tests after if your ANOVA is significant. Um, there are a lot of functions in R built in to get out pairwise. Um, t-tests that are adjusted for multiple comparison corrections by default. Um, if you've learned about ANOVA, you know the kind of standard one is to use Tukey's method, and there's a function in R called Tukey HSD that takes as input your AOV output. And you can see here I'm running the two-factor ANOVA, but without the interaction. So Tukey's gives me the age one versus zero comparison, and then the pregnancy category, all the pairwise comparisons between the three categories. Um, but you can see the p-values are different than what we saw in linear regression. And that is because it has that two keys adjustment, the way that it, it calculates the p-value actually takes into account the fact that you're doing three tests rather than um, testing them each individually. So you can get all that out. And actually Tidy works on that output as well. So you could, pull out that as a, as a tibble, as a data frame and get the p-values here if you need it, like to make a plot or something. I don't know if you needed it for something. So, but there are actually a lot of other functions and other ways to get p-value or pairwise tests out. Um, but this is, I'd say, a co pretty common one. Um, so just a warning, I was mentioning uh, multiple testing corrections. So consider what a p-value actually means. So if a test is performed at say the common 0.05 p-value cutoff level, which means type one error, we expect to be protected and estimated to be no more than 0.05. <coughs> and suppose we ran that test and actually the null hypothesis was true, um, then there is only a 5% chance of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. And that is an acceptable risk and that's what we, have all is for some reason as a society decided is the right number, 5%. Um, but if we're pet testing, for example, a thousand times, um, this happens a lot more in genetic and omics type data when you have say 30,000 genes and you're running 30,000 tests, that is where you really get into trouble because all of if all of those were null, the expected number of incorrect rejections would be 0.05 times the number of tests. So if you're doing a thousand, you would expect 50 false positives. So when people talk about multiple correction, multiple testing correction, that's really what they're talking about is the number of false positives has, has probably gone way up. And so when you do an ANOVA, the ANOVA tries to protect against that by being a bit more conservative in the way that it calculates the p-value. Um, and there are many other ways, uh, I should have put a couple examples, but there's a p-adjust function. Um, which can adjust like a long list of p-values. And there are many ways, Bonaferroni, Bonaferroni correction, FDR type corrections like Benjamini Hochberg and um, BH I think is, a, is actually that one. But there are a lot of ways to adjust your p-values for that. So if you've, if you've had to deal with that, just know that R has lots of, lots of methods. Um, the other one is the q-value package. Um, which is another way to calculate FDR false discovery rate. So people who are in that world of omics are probably the most familiar with this concept um, and R has a lot of ways to deal with it. All right, so hmm, maybe let's do another little quick break, five minutes, and then we'll come back and finish up logistic regression at least. Come back at like 5.30.
Okay. So the next section is logistic regression, which um, is a commonly used regression when you have a binary or zero one outcome. And there are a lot of different regression models that fit into this overall bucket called generalized, generalized linear models like Poisson regression, negative binomial regression, Poisson regression with different link functions and so on. Um, I don't wanna to get too much into generalized linear models. That's also a whole other class, um, but just so you know, instead of the, um, it's still a linear model because we have this idea of a linear predictor, which is our covariates times our coefficients. Um, actually, it's hard to, oh well, yeah, I should show you the knitted version of this. Um, but this is essentially the formula where you model um, your expected value of your outcome y given your x based on the link function g. So in the logistic regression, that's what we call the logit or the log odds function. And then your linear predictor, which is like age times beta plus sex times beta plus BMI times beta, et cetera. That's your sum of your coefficients and multiplied by your data, your predictor variables, or your what we also call the independent variables. Um, so this idea that we're linking a mean, or in, in the case of a binary variable, it's a, equivalent to the probability to our linear predictor makes it a linear model. And what that means for R is that we can use the function GLM, which stands for generalized linear model, but we have to specify the family. And that family just means what's the distribution of our model? Is it binomial, is it Poisson? What's the distribution of our outcome? And what is the link function? Um, each family has by default a link function built in. If you're doing something like Poisson and you wanna change the link function from or if you're doing a binomial and you want to change it to a log link function, for example, um, you can do that in R. But generally, I just run the default by saying I want a logistic regression. I'm going to use the GLM function. I use the formula in the same way that I do for an LM function, but I have to specify family equals binomial. Um, and so this is, you can, if you don't know LaTeX code, this is going to look, oh, oh, if I hover, I can see it. Um, so this is the log of the odds. So log of the probability over one minus the probability. That's the logit function. That's why it's called logistic, logistic regression. That's our link function. Um, so what we're estimating here is what are the log odds of, of glucose, essentially every one unit increase in glucose. So let's look at that. Um, now I wish I hadn't admitted this. There we go. Okay, so again, the output from fit GLM is not that interesting. So we want summary fit GLM to see all the useful stuff. We can see glucose highly significantly associated with diabetes. Obviously that makes sense because that's essentially how you diagnose diabetes often or one way. Um, and we get an estimate, a standard error, key value, all the extra stuff, five observations deleted due to the missingness, similar information that we get from the linear model, but um, with the, with the caveat that now we're running a logistic regression. So it's different estimates and different interpretation. Um, so what exactly is this fitting though? Um, what is our outcome? If you remember, diabetes was positive and negative, but a logistic regression takes a value that is essentially a Bernoulli random variable. So, or binomial with size one, where we have a success and we have a failure or a one and a zero. So what's the one and the zero here? It's not entirely clear. Um, and that's because what R did for us without us asking was take diabetes, make it a factor first, and then turn it into numeric. So if we think about it, what that means is that the factor alphabetized our levels, first being negative, second being positive, and then it made negative a one and positive a two. Um, and I can show you that this is exactly what happened. So positive was converted to two, negative was converted to one. And then behind the scenes in GLM, it said, okay, well, two, I'm gonna, the bigger number, I'm gonna assume that means your success. And I'm gonna assume the smaller number is your failure. So it did what we wanted it to do. It showed us 
glucose, higher glucose is associated with diabetes. But that was sort of by accident um, because of how our, our factor ended up being coded. So what I would recommend is to create actually a zero one variable where you know exactly what your one is. Um, and so I created something called a column called diabetes yes. And I said one times diabetes equals positive. You could do this with if else or case when. Um, my kind of shorthand way is to do the math on this, this test. Um, so what is that? If we look at the table, we get ones are positive, zeros are negative. Great, that's, that's what I wanna use as my outcome. So I would fit the model where that is my outcome. So I know exactly that it's testing what I think it's testing. And it's the same because that is exactly the same outcome um, in the same direction. That's good. So Broom, again, um, we'll take a tidy of our GLM. Um, one thing we might want to do, though, is we can, let's just, first, let me just run Broom. Oh, oh man. Um, here we go. Too many keyboard shortcuts. I mean, sometimes I get lost. Okay, what I meant to do was copy this and then just run the default broom. So we end up with that coefficient table. This is the log odds ratio associated with glucose increase of one. We get our p-values, et cetera. Um, but we can also tell broom that we want to exponentiate, which means we get the odds ratios and return a confidence interval. This is me um, making p-value look nicer and rounding my digits to two. And so that table, we end up with an odds ratio of 1.04 for every one millimeter per deciliter, whatever the glucose measurement unit is, is associated with a, an odds, mul multiplicative odds increase of 1.04. The standard error is so small that it got rounded to zero. And the p-value is very significant. And we get confidence intervals, 1.03 to 1.05. So usually people like to report odds ratios instead of log odds ratios for interpretab interpretability, but you could do either. Um, and so if you look at this again, here is the table regression output. And by default, it shows us the log odds ratio. Um, and you can uh, do the same thing where I say, I want to exponentiate equals true, same. Um, test, and the same kind of option. And so now we have our odds ratio and our, our confidence interval around that as well. So some very similar to linear regression, we could again, fit multiple models, merge them all together. So I fit three different models. Um, this one has insulin, this one has pregnant, pregnant ever. So you can just kind of see what happens if you have a variety of predictors in different models. Uh, so we see three, I didn't name them. So I just named them by default table one, two, three. We can see that insulin was only in that first model. Pregnancies, number of pregnancies was input as a, a numeric value. So this is for every increase in one pregnancy. You get a, did I say odds ratio? No, log odds ratio increases by 0.11 or the dichotomized ever versus never pregnant was not significant. Um, and that's the log odds ratio estimate for that. So I have you can a question. Kind of come, yeah. Did you, did you just pipe those all together and then they showed up in the same Oh table? yeah. Sorry, I should have said, so, tip, oh, so this is, okay. yes, I did a couple of things. So I okay. made three table regressions and then I have to use table merge to put them all together, yeah. So um, this, if I just look at that one, is one of those tables. And this is- Got it. Yep, so it's the model sense. and then that, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yep. Yeah. sorry, it's just said that. Um, so table merge is in GT summary too. It's, they all work together. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think this, so for, I do want to go over this, I think. So going along with prediction, um, I mentioned that when you're doing a linear model, you're predicting the means. 
Um, when you're doing a logistic remodel, logistic model in a binary out outcome, you're also predicting a mean, but your mean is a probability. Um, so the probability that diabetes is yes, basically. Um, directly, when we look at the linear predictors, so that like, for instance, um, looking at this model, age times 0.05 plus but BMI times 0.08 plus glucose times 0.04 plus insulin is basically not useful. Um, that is our linear predictor, the, that kind of adding up of the beta times our data, our variables, our predictors. Um, that linear predictor is one kind of prediction. So we can use our model to, to calculate that linear predictor and say that is a prediction of our log odds ratio. Um, comparing, it gets complicated, but essentially that's the log odds that we're estimating. Um, so when you talk about prediction in terms of a, a binary variable, most often you're thinking about predicting risk. So I wanna predict diabetes risk. What's the probability that I have diabetes right now? Um, if you're doing kind of a prospective study and you're looking over time, you might be predicting diabetes risk over 10 years or something, but a logistic regression it's just looking at a snapshot in time. So based on my age, BMI, glucose, pregnancy number, what are my, what's my probability of, of being diabetic essentially? Um, and you can pull that out again from the augment function in Broom. So here I fit my model. This is just the output from a GLM from the logistic regression. So let's just run that line. So if I look at this, it's just the, the GLM output. Um, those are my coefficient estimates. And so augment in the broom package takes that as input. Um, the other thing though, is I need uh, a data set. Um, it likes to not have any missing data in my data. So I manually removed that. Um, and I only removed from the four rows that had missing variables and the four uh, predictor variables. And so that's the data I'm fitting on. Um, if I look at this, I get, again, row names, well, that's from my, my new data, pregnant value, glucose value, et cetera. And if I look at what augment gives me, um, it gives me a fitted column. Um, and we can see just looking at this, this is not the probability. It's not predicting the probability, it's predicting the log odds. So we can see, that it varies because we have neg very negative values, we have positive values. So that's our linear predictor, that's X times beta. Um, we also get the residuals, again, just like we did in the linear uh, prediction, <coughs> linear regression prediction, sorry. Um, and we get some other Cook's distance and, and then all that other stuff. So again, I'm mostly fit, fixated on the fitted values. What is, what am I, predicting based on this model. So let's just kind of visualize that. So here I'm plotting the distribution through a box plot and a violin plot of those fitted values from my model stratified by diabetes. And then I added some labels to make it a little more clear. So the violin plot shows the density and the box plot shows the kind of median in a quartile range and so on. So we can see that in negative diabetes patients, the predicted log odds ratio, predicted log odds is lower than it is in the diabetes positive participants, which is what we would expect. Um, and what do we do with this? Uh, if you've worked in any kind of prediction, you've probably heard of ROC curves in AUC. That's a common way to summarize how well a model is predicting our outcome. ROC curves are kind of confusing and, and I think if you have never seen them before, this is gonna be very foreign. But if you have seen them before, just know that in R, there are many, many packages to make, to calculate AOC, to calculate prediction accuracy and to calculate ROC curves. I'm using PROC here because I think it's kind of simple, but if you wanna something with a lot of options, there are other packages um, to look at. Uh, so I'll show you that in a second, but just so you know, that's how we're gonna evaluate our prediction. And the predicted probability that we're getting out 
is the fitted, the, I'm sorry, the, the fitted values are our linear predictors. If we want the predicted probability, we can use the anti-log function, which is the inverse of the logit. And we get exponent of the fitted divided by one plus the exponent of the fitted. So that's the inverse function of the log odds function. And if we calculate that, we can get what we call predicted probabilities. And if I plot that, so here I've added a column of predicted probabilities, which I'm calling predprob, predicted probabilities, where I calculated them explicitly from the fitted column. And I'm plotting that instead of the linear predictor. So it's just a function of the fitted values. And again, we see very low and general values for negative diabetic population and higher values. So we get kind of this double um, hump, you know, like two modes distribution, bimodal distribution. But on average, we do see higher predicted probabilities in people who are diabetic. So that means our model is working pretty well. But to quantify how well our model is working, that's where we, people tend to use AUC and ROC. Um, so to learn more about ROC curves, Wikipedia actually has a really good explanation of, of the components of an ROC curve. So an ROC curve is a plot of specificity versus sensitivity. Um, living in COVID times, I'm sure we've all heard these words way more often than we would have related to like tests of COVID or antibody tests and all of that. Um, so we might be more familiar with that. But in general, this has to do with whether your classification is working. Um, but in order to get there, we need a classification. So right now, we only have a continuous value. We have this predicted probability. Um, and to do a classification is what happens when we pick a cutoff value. So you could, your cutoff value could be anywhere between zero and one. Let's just say I'm gonna classify you as having diabetes if my model predicts that your probability is higher than say 0.5, that's a common cutoff. But really, anytime you pick a cutoff along this y-axis, you are creating a risk rule, a classification rule. And that rule inherently is gonna have a sensitivity value and a specificity value, a true positive rate and a true negative rate. Um, so again, if you've never seen classification before, this is going to be all new, um, but we can calculate all of this stuff. We could calculate it all by hand. Um, I'm going to show you how you would calculate one set of sensitivity and specificity for one cutoff rule. So like I said, I've calculated my predicted probabilities, which is this stuff. I can see that in diabetics it's higher and, and in um, non-diabetics it's lower. So I'm gonna make a classification rule where everybody that had a probability up above 0.5, I'm gonna call them, um, classify them as having diabetes and below that is non-diabetes. Um, so if a new person walks in and they get a P of 0.6, then I would say, I bet that you have diabetes based on my rule. Um, and whether that's accurate or not, we can estimate from our data. So our classification rule is one if the probability is greater than 0.5, zero otherwise. So I've just added a new column. I'll just show you this. Look at that data all the way at the end. Predicted probability is 0.65 for the first person. That means I would classify them as having diabetes. The next person, um, is very, very low. So I would test them as not having diabetes, but what are they actually, what is their true value? You can see this is their true um, measurement of whether they actually have been diagnosed with diabetes and we actually got it right both times for those two people. But we need a summary measure across everybody. So looking at the cross table of the predicted classification and the true classification, which is on the column here, and this is my prediction classification here. Um, let me just run the whole code. I first calculated the percent because I really want the probability that it is a true positive versus a true negative. And so people that are truly positive diabetes, if I classify them using this rule, 57, almost 58% are true positives. So I've given them a one when they should have had a one. 
Whereas true negatives are people that I classify as not having diabetes when they did not actually have diabetes. And that's actually pretty high. So it's 87.5%. So this is specificity. This is sensitivity. Um, and that is just a very simple way to calculate it based on one classification rule, um, based on a very, very simple way of making a classifier out of a logistic regression. Um, so that's one cutoff, right? I've calculated one sensitivity, one specificity. But the ROC curve plots these values for all cutoffs between zero and one. So it varies this number. So it starts out at zero, increases to one and calculates these two points. And that is what gets put on an ROC curve. So let me just show you um, an ROC curve. So you know what I'm talking about. So if you've seen something like this before, where sometimes it says uh, false or true positive, or, no, true, true negative rate on the bottom, true positive rate on the top or something along those lines. Here I have written specificity and sensitivity. And so this, because it is uh, pretty far off the diagonal, we can see that this is a pretty good model. Um, most models in real life are not that nice looking actually. So going back to this kind of cutoff example, the package ROC curve, um, not sorry, what's it called? PROC, package PROC has a function called ROC, which you take your true outcome, which is what I put in my model, and then my fitted values. And a side note, you will get the same ROC curve and the same AUC value, whether you use the fitted linear predictor or the predicted probabilities. And that's because this, that anti-logit function that I used to calculate this is just a monotone function. So it's not gonna matter. The ordering doesn't matter. Um, if one is higher than some cutoff using the fitted probabilities, it's gonna be higher using the equivalent cutoff for predicted probabilities. So that's just math. It just ends up being the same exact thing. So I just calculated this. I calculated the AUC. Let me have it here so you can see it. AUC which is a one number summary of that ROC curve is 0.83, which is very good. Um, anything above 0.5 means that you are able to classify people well with your prediction rule. Um, 0.83, not well, but well, it all depends on, it depends on a lot, but um, 0.83 is good. <laughs> That's really what I'm trying to say. Um, the 95% confidence levels between like 0.8 and 0.863, um, also pretty good. So this is a good model for diabetes. Those are important predictors. We are able to sort out people between um, low risk of diabetes and high risk of diabetes pretty well. Um, if you wanna plot that ROC curve, you would put input the object. So this is the output from ROC function. And, and then I use the function ggroc, which actually is in the back end using ggplot to make an ROC curve. And so that's the simple one that I showed you is this curve here. Um, it's pretty common to add the horizontal line, which I'm adding here with geom segment. I actually just copied this from the example code and in, in that help documentation. Down here, if you see some of, they have examples done here to add stuff to your ROC curve. So I use that. I changed the theme, I changed the label. And I used glue to add in the AUC value as my subtitle. You can see that here, a little bit nicer. So you can see the horizontal or the vertical no, diagonal line, we'll get there eventually. The diagonal line is like the random coin flip classifying based on a random classifier is not good. If you're a lot higher than that line, that's a good sign. That means that your prediction is doing well. Um, and going back to my point about how every value of your cutoff creates a point on this line. So I mentioned that if I use the cutoff P of 0.5 and I said, I'm gonna classify everyone with a predicted probability higher than 0.5 as being diabetic and vice versa, lower than that than not diabetic, that's a point on this line. And so I said specificity was like 0.875 and sensitivity was what, five? Oh yeah, I have it here, like 60%. So it's somewhere over here. And I can actually find that point. Here I'm adding just one point. 
And then I used another new function. I just kept throwing in a bunch of other functions that I use pretty often um, inside this package called GG Repel. There's a GM label repel. Um, GM label is a built-in ggplot function, but it sometimes is hard to see when it's like overlapping the, the data points. So I use the repel version and you'll see, let's run it so you can see what it is. It makes this little label next to the point that it's um, like representing. So this one, ca one calculation for one cutoff is one point on the line. And so you can identify um, that that classifier is there on that curve. Um, sometimes people will say, I wanna restrict specificity to be very high, like 95%, and then figure out what the cutoff is there. And that you would use as your binary classifier. Um, so in this case, you would have pretty low sensitivity though, but you could restrict your specificity to be high if it was very important to you to not have any false negatives. Um, so that's, really, really overview of prediction with ROC curves. But I just wanted you to know that there are many ways to, to build prediction models and get out predictions and evaluate predictions. Um, AUC is just one measure of prediction accuracy. There's many others um, and different packages will calculate those for you. So definitely look into that if you're, if you're working on that. Um, any questions about that very fast ROC curve thing. <laughs> I know someone mentioned that they were interested in ROC curves, so I wanted to show it at least once. Okay, I think that, um, oh, that's out of place. Let's see, what time is it? Okay, one more thing and then we'll, we'll finish. Um, I don't know why I put this, this should have been up above ROC curves, so that's why I wanna say that. Um, inside of GT summary, there's this function called table UV regression. Um, so I was showing you table underscore regression, but the function table UV regression will automatically run all the univariate regression models for you on the list of predictors that you give it um, on every column in your data set, essentially. So this can be useful if you have a lot of predictors and you're doing kind of a univariate scan you want to see which predictors to include in your model. It's not an official model building method like um, backward forward selection or whatever, like all, all that kind of thing. It's not like regularized regression, but a lot of people like to just show both the univariate regression models and the multivariate regression, multi, multiple regression models together. Um, and so this is useful. It's just a useful thing to know. So what I'm going to do is run univariate regression models using GLM where Y is diabetes, yes, my outcome. And I'm gonna tell it family binomial, that's the argument to GLM. I copied this, I mean, you can see the, in the help, it's the same example basically. So you can see um, all the arguments, but down here somewhere, there's some examples using Cox regression and I think this is, yeah, GLM. So this is a little just regression, um, but you can look at the help and it will show you what all these arguments are specifying. But the idea is, is it's running the regressions for you. So you have to tell it everything that you want in the GLM. And then I'm saying exponent each eight equals true. Um, I'm adding global p-values. I'm adding n event, which is the number of diabetes cases in each um, category defined by the column. You can even do multiple comparison adjustments. So add Q, adjust the p-values for multiple testing. And then this bolds based on significance. So if you have a lot of variables, you'll get a little bit more of an idea of what, what is a predictor. So in this case, as we've seen, like all of these values are highly predictive. So if we look at this, eventually, slow. Um, we can see, so this was the, the odds ratio for age in the univariate model. So this is only age predictive of diabetes, diabetes yes, no. All the p-values and q-values, which are the adjusted p-values are, are less than one, less than zero, zero, 01, really significant except for a pregnant ever. Um, but you can see, why this isn't scrolling? Down here, I don't know why, let me pop it out. 
And here you can see all of them individually. There we go. So these are all the univariate odds ratios from each of our predictors. We can see um, the pedigree function is actually the most, has the biggest odds ratio. Um, but it's a good, it's just a good thing if, to get quickly get out a lot of different univariate regressions, which is something that you might want to do. Um, so we'll stop there and next time finish this up and I can probably add in a couple other things that we can talk about. Um, and until then, let me know if you have questions on the final. I will have office hours on Friday again at 10 um, if you need to ask anything. So good luck. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Yeah.